button. Good afternoon. I think it's going to be good evening shortly. Um, I'm Dr. Robin Crabtree. I'm the Dean of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, for those of you who don't know me. And on behalf of LMU's leadership, especially President Timothy Law Snyder and Provost Thomas Poon, it's my honor and delight to welcome you all to the annual Michael Huffington Lecture, I want to, which is being live streamed, simulcast, recorded for posterity, yes. Um, I especially want to welcome our distinguished speaker, Oleksandra Matu uh, Matvichuk, whose work on behalf of peace and humanity provides an extraordinary example of what it looks like to live with courage and conviction. We're grateful for your presence with us, particularly during this time when all of our minds are preoccupied with the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East and when your work is so urgent. Uh, it's always delightful to see students here, though I wish there were more, um, because gathering and, and, and faculty uh, always, including emeritus faculty, I see, uh, important for us to gather and consider topics and perspectives uh, of those who are working on the ground, uh, with this, this kind of gathering enriches our um, academic discourse and manifests the best of what it means to be part of an intellectual community. For, so for those of you who still show up in person, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I know many others will be tuning in through um, virtual means. Um, I especially want students to take note that Ms. Matt, Ms. Matvichuk, you know, I'm not a Slavic speaker of all the languages I speak. As a lawyer um, and that of the NGOs that she works with, demonstrate how painstaking and rigorous research and analysis, interdisciplinary lenses for problem solving, cross-cultural dialogue and collaborative decision making, relentless pursuit of religious and academic freedom, liberal arts values and commitments people all come into play in the day-to-day -day work of individuals and NGOs in the building of solidarity, in the slow work of peacemaking. For these and many reasons that align so closely with LMU's mission commitments, Alexandra Matvichuk is being awarded LMU's presidential citation. I know it's not a surprise, but congratulations. And we'll be giving that in a few minutes. It is a surprise? I have just given you the surprise. But it's going to be ceremony, so there's you know, that was sort of the circumstance, the pomp is yet to come. Um, this evening is being co-sponsored by several departments and programs across BCLA and others at LMU, but I want to recognize um, especially the Huffington Ecumenical Institute, especially the work of our indefatigable director, uh, Father Cyril Hoverun, whose life is also lived in the pursuit of peace, freedom, and human dignity. Um, I, I have to recognize the generosity of our primary benefactor, Mr. My Michael Huffington, who's been engaged with LMU over many, many years now. His Michael, hi. We miss you. Um, his vision and partnership has, have enabled us to host this lecture as part of the Huffington Institute's annual programming and in fulfillment of its broader mission, promoting ecumenism and interreligious dialogue and thereby contributing to the cause of peace and harmony around the world. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. I want you to enjoy the evening. I hope people will take advantage of the break and the reception afterwards to talk about, uh, about all of the content. I want to thank the panelists, BCLA faculty Kim Harris from Theological Studies and Stella O oh from Women's and Gender Studies and Nigel Robb from the History Department. 
Um, and now it's my honor to introduce Father Cyril Hovrun, who is clinical associate professor here in BCLA and director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. He is an internationally known and preeminent expert on Orthodox Christianity, ecumenism, and Christian unity with a focus on social ethics and historical contexts in mostly post-World War um, uh, eras. Uh, and movements impacting Orthodox Christianity and its theologies. He's also a peace activist who speaks and writes widely on these topics. And among his many books, his volume, Political Orthodoxies, The Unorthodoxies of the Church Coerced, has been the subject of much attention, wanted and unwanted, uh, related to the issues unfolding in Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, so Father Cyril will kick off, uh, introduce the program, and kick off the ceremonies. Oh, thank you, Robin, for this um, generous introduction. Um, thank you for welcoming um, uh, our audiences, both online and offline audiences, um, to, uh, to this lecture. Um, this is a second, I should say a bit, a bit about this, uh, this series of lectures. This is a second um, uh, in the series of Michael Huffington lectures. This series is organized uh, by the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at LMU, and it is our institute's contribution to LMU and uh, to the wider Los Angeles community. And we are happy to have uh, members of the wider Los Angeles community here in this audience, not just LMU people. Um, the first lecture took place five years ago, uh, which looks like in the century before the last one, given all the events uh, that followed. At that time, uh, we invited the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, Reverend Dr. Olaf Fuchs-Tweit. He is now the Prezes, or the Primate of the Bishops' Conference of the Lutheran Church of, Church of Norway, and we keep in touch. Uh, so we try to do keep in touch with all our speakers, with everyone with whom we engage. <clears throat> This time, our guest uh, speaker is also very special. Uh, I will not list all Alexandra Matvichuk's awards, uh, positions, and achievements. Uh, we will need to take the entire time of this lecture to do this. Uh, we have, however, highlighted some of them in the leaflet that you've received, uh, so you can inspect um, uh, some of her achievements there. I would also only mention that she, indeed, as, as the Dean said, um, is the head of uh, an NGO, Center for uh, Civil Liberties. In 2022, uh, this organization was awarded the Nobel uh, Peace Prize jointly, jointly with the Belarusian prisoner of conscience, Alice uh, Belyatsky, and the Russian organization Memori Memorial, Memorial, which focuses on documenting crimes against human dignity and rights uh, in the Gulag and elsewhere across the Soviet Union. Alexandra's uh, Center for Civil Liberties documents similar crimes in modern Ukraine, in post-Soviet Ukraine. Her team, and uh, some members of her team came actually here to Los Angeles, I should acknowledge it. So her team started uh, uh, by bringing to light of publicity and justice the violations and crimes committed by Russia's backed regime of Viktor Yanukovych. Probably don't remember him anymore, but he was pretty much on the front pages in 2014. Those crimes culminated in the massacre of, protester, of protesters during the Revolution of, of Dignity that happened exactly in the time, in the winter 2013-2014. After 2014, and especially since February 2022, the center has been active, very active, in collecting data about Russian crimes on both occupied and deoccupied -occup territories of Ukraine. The center is a protagonist of the Ukrainian civil society. Uh, the latter is a remarkable political phenomenon and one of the strongest in the world. Well, we in Ukraine, we tend to, to describe ourselves as, as unique in many ways. So, uh, well, in most cases, this is wrong. We are not unique. We are quite like others. But when it comes to the civil society, I believe we are quite unique. I should acknowledge it. Uh, this society appears to be stronger than the Ukrainian state, for example, and, and keeps... Uh, 
um, keeping in check, you know, the state. And it is stronger even, the, even, uh, uh, even stronger than Putin's regime. It prevented Ukraine from sliding to autocracy, autocracy under Yanukovych and continues safeguarding Ukrainian democracy. It is also Putin's scariest nightmare. If he has dreams, I don't know if he's still a human. If he's a human, he has dreams. And in those dreams, in his nightmares, the Ukrainian civil activists appear as his uh, worst uh, uh, dreams. He started the war against Ukraine to protect his autocracy in Russia from the examples set by the Ukrainian civil movement and organizations such as Center for Civil Liberties. Putin considers people like Alexandra uh, his arch enemies, and they do not disappoint him. Alexandra hits the... Alexandra hits the most neural neurologic part of Putin's sensitivities by campaigning to bring him and his accomplices to justice. Justice is at the core of her activities and the topic of today's lecture. Alexandra is known mostly as a human rights lawyer and activist, but there is a less known side of her profile that I'd like to underline. She worked for many years with a prominent Ukrainian public thinker and theologian, Yevhen Sverstyuk. He was a Soviet dissident who spent several years in the prisons and concentration camps in Siberia. He could be also identified as one of the fathers of the Ukrainian public theology. His Christian faith inspired him to fight the Soviet Leviathan and advocate for dignity, rights, and justice. Alexandra, in her own way, very creative way, I would say, continues his work. And I would like to use this opportunity to acknowledge Yevhen Sverstyuk's uh, uh, input uh, to the human rights uh, movement and to the uh, Christian public theology. Well, we had some common friends with Alexandra in Ukraine, but we did not meet, uh, did not know each other until last summer. Then Alexandra reached out to me on Facebook and suggested to meet up. She wanted to discuss some interchurch relations uh, matters, interchurch relations in Ukraine and their social implications. We had lunch when the idea of her coming to Los Angeles popped up. And I'm very glad that this idea is materializing so soon, right now. Well, I consider it a sort of miracle, given her schedule. Uh, Alexander will be uh, talking today on the topic, Unpublished, Unpunished Evil Grows. Why do we need to ch change the global approach to war crimes justice? After her presentation, there will be a panel discussion, as it was mentioned uh, already by the Dean. And our panelists indeed represent different departments within the BCLA. Uh, uh, BCLA. Um, I will not mention the achievements. You can read again about them on the leaflet, uh, about the achievements of um, um, uh, our panelists. Um, and uh, uh, that's, um, uh, that's what I would, uh, would like to say in my introduction. And now I think it's time for, for the ritual. Like in the Orthodox liturgy uh, and in the Catholic liturgy in the Mass, we have like two parts, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of, um, uh, of um, uh, ritual, kind of the liturgy of Eucharist, the liturgy of ritual action. This is the time for ritual action to be performed by, uh, by Robin, please. see how beautiful this is. We have not done this many times. Uh, this is only the second time I've been personally involved with a presidential citation. And so I'm going to read it for everyone, and especially for Alexander. Oh, I can, I can, oh, okay. We can, it's all, it's all, because uh, this thing is huge. Whereas, a, uh, a native of Ukraine, you have devoted your life to defending human rights, dignity, and justice in your country and worldwide. Whereas, you respect a people who fight bravely for freedom and democracy, sacrificing the life and well-being of their children. Whereas, you were active in the revolution of dignity in Ukraine in the winter of 2013-14, also known as Euromaidan, 
and initiated a grassroots legal assistance initiative in response to the violent dispersal of a peaceful student demonstration in Kiev, Ukraine on November 30, 2013. Whereas following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 22, you co-created the Tribunal for Putin initiative to document international crimes under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in all regions of Ukraine targeted by Russian attack. Whereas in your role as Vice President of the International Federation for Human Rights, you have cultivated collaboration across 192 organizations from 112 countries to build networks of solidarity and resistance that protect and promote human rights. Whereas you are the head of the Center for Civil Liberties, which was founded in 2007 to protect human rights in Ukraine and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, in 2014, the center became the world's first human rights organization to send mobile teams to document war crimes in Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk, regions of Ukraine. Under your visionary leadership, the center has empowered ordinary people in the fight for freedom, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022 for its work documenting war crimes and human rights abuses in Russian-occupied Ukrainian territory. Be it known, Loyola Marymount University extends its heartfelt gratitude and proudly honors Oleksandra Matvichuk for your impact on human rights, justice, and faith, and for bringing these moral principles and us together, presented on the 11th day of April in the year 2024. Timothy Law Snyder, President. I don't know if this is going to fit in your suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> I have a huge suitcase. suitcase. OK, I think we're going to uh, go. Let's go down with these flowers so they can do some photographs. But my goodness. Yeah. Now, uh, yes, I just need to say that now the floor is Alexandra's. Uh, she has, um, well, she, she will speak, please. It's a huge honor for me to address to this distinguished audience. I am a human rights lawyer for many years I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity. Now I'm in a situation when the law doesn't work. 10 years ago, millions of people in Ukraine peacefully participated in the revolution of dignity and the authoritarian regime collapsed. We got a chance to build a country where the rights of everybody are protected. Government is accountable, judiciary, is independent, and police do not beat students who are peacefully demonstrating. In order to stop us on this path, 10 years ago, Russia started a war. Russia occupied Crimea and Donbas, and two years ago, Russia extended this war to a full-scale invasion. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO, Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom. We have faced an unprecedented numbers of war crimes. We join our efforts with dozens of regional organizations and build a national network of documentators throughout the country, including the occupied territories. We have an ambitious goal to document every criminal episode that has been committed in the smallest settlement in each oblast of the country. Working together, 
we have already recorded and contributed over 68,000 episodes of war crimes. There is no justification for Russians' action. There is no reason in doing this. There is no legitimate purpose to force people to go down into the basement and no purpose in shooting them. No purpose in using tanks to have fun firing at people on bicycles whose bodies lay scattered around the streets until liberation. No purpose in breaking in someone's house, killing the owner and raping a mother next to her nine-year-old child. No purpose in shooting a 14-year-old boy in a close range who was just playing with his ball in the yard. And there is no military necessity for it. Russians did these horrible things only because they could. Russia uses war crimes as the methods of warfare. Russia tries to break people's resistance and occupy the country by inflicting immense pain on civilian population. We are documented more than just violations of Geneva and Hague Conventions. We are documenting human pain. I have one question. How we people who live in 21st century will defend a human beings, their lives, their freedom, and their human dignity? Can we rely on the law, or does just brutal force matter? The answer for this question, important not just for people in Ukraine, in Iran, in Syria, in Sudan, or Nicaragua, the answer for this question will define our common future. When you know history, it's difficult to remain an idealist. The 20th century brought two devastating world wars, terrible colonial wars, millions of deaths, and the dehumanization of humankind, which reached its most concrete form in the Holocaust and Nazi concentration camps. The horrible lessons of the past demanded decisive action. Responsibility for what had been perpetrators was codified in the slogan, never again. Governments created the United Nations systems and signed international agreements. The idea that every person is free and equal in the dignity and rights came to characterize the new post-war humanism. But evil can be vanished once and for all. Each day we make a choice. Democracy, the rule of law and human rights were realized in practice in only a part of the world. Meanwhile, the totalitarian Soviet Gulag was never condemned or punished. There has been no responsibility. And that is why, in Russia, the end of the Second World War is celebrated with the slogan, we can repeat. Thus, evil keeps coming back. The destruction of Grozny, a city of a half a million people, the Russian bombardment of Aleppo, the firebombing of Mariupol, and the bodies of people killed on the streets of Bucha. Unpunished evil grows. Russian troops committed horrible war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Libya, in Syria, in other countries of the world. They have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. I talked to hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. They told me how they were beaten, raped, smashed into wooden boxes, electrically shocked through their genitalia, and their fingers were cut 
their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled. One woman told me how her eye was stuck out with a spoon. If we want to prevent wars in the future, we have to punish states and their leaders who start such wars in present. Because all atrocities which we are documenting stem from their leadership decision to start the war. But in the whole history of humankind, we have only one precedent of punishment for the crime of aggression. It was Nuremberg trial. And we still look at the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trials, where Nazi war criminals were tried only after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we are living in a new century. Justice shouldn't be dependent on how and when the war will end. We cannot wait. The global approach to war crime justice must be changed. We must establish a special tribunal on aggression and hold Putin, Lukashenko, and top political leadership and high military command of the Russian state accountable. This war turns people into the numbers because the scale of war crimes grows so fast that it becomes impossible to recognize all the stories. But I will tell you one. The story of Svetlana, who lost her entire family when a Russian missile hit her building. I heard them dying. My husband was breathing heavily, straining as he was trying to throw the rubble off himself, but he couldn't. At some point, he just went still. My grandmother and Zhenya died instantly. I heard my daughter crying. Then she also went quiet. As for my son, my mother told me that he called me for several times, and then nothing. People are not numbers. We must ensure justice for all people affected by this war, regardless who they are, their social position, the types of crimes and cruelty they endured, and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their case. We must return people their names because the life of each person matters. People in Ukraine want peace much more than anyone else. But peace doesn't come when the country which was invaded stopped fighting. That's not peace. That's occupation. Occupation is just another form of the war. Occupation is not changing one state flag to another. Occupation means torture, enforced disappearances, rapes, denial of your identity, forcible adoption of your own children, filtration camps, and mass graves. Russia unleashed terror in the occupied territories to keep them under control. The Russian military exterminates local activists, mayors, public figures, journalists, volunteers, priests, artists. People do not have any opportunity to protect their freedom, their property, their lives, and their beloved ones. This is a photo of the one of unmarked graves in the forest near Izum. The murder children writer Volodymyr Vakulenko was found in this grave under the number 319 after the liberation of these territories. Volodymyr Vakulenko wrote the beautiful stories for children and entire generation of Ukrainian children brought up on his daddy's book. 
During the Russian occupation, he disappeared. I know his family. His family hoped to the last that he's alive, but just like thousands of other Ukrainian civilians are in Russian captivity. And it was very difficult for them to accept the results of identification. Just a month ago, the Russians tortured to death father Stepan Podolchak from an occupied village in Kherson. They abducted a 59 years old priest from his home and took him away barefooted with a bag over his head, having turned his home upside down. After two days, the Russian said to his wife that vast father Stepan died. Before his illegal arrest, they several times tried to force him to transfer his new built church and its congregation into Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarch. Father Stepan had refused, insisting that he wouldn't betray his oath nor his congregation. We can't leave people alone for torture and death under Russian occupation. People's lives can't be a political compromise. Sustainable peace is freedom to live without fear and to have a long-term perspective. Calls for Ukraine to stop defending itself and to satisfy Russia's imperial appetites are not just wrong, they are immoral. Several years ago, we created the Religious Freedom Roundtable in Ukraine. The representatives of the countries, different churches, confessions, and civil society organizations united their efforts to assert religious freedom and development of peace. We have a huge problem with freedom of religion in the occupied territories. Russia doesn't recognize the freedom of religion but considers it as a collective category that depends only on loyalty to the Russian authorities. Russian army forcibly introduced repressive Russian legislation in the occupied Ukrainian territories. It's created a wide opportunities for prosecuting entire religious communities and individual believers. It's not surprising that after only three years of occupation of Crimea, the official number of religious communities fell by 63% there. We recorded cases of persecution for reading the Bible and prayer, distributing leaflets with an invitation to the house of prayer, religious songs, and other actions that the occupation authorities equal to illegal missionary activity. The Russian army is systematically destroyed buildings of temples, synagogues, and churches in Ukraine. Over two years of full-scale war, more than 500 religious buildings were destroyed or damaged during hostilities. We documented cases in which religious figures were killed, tortured, or illegally detained by the occupiers after starting this war. Let me read a words of the Protestant passport, pastor Alexander Homchenko, whom I interviewed by myself. Here is how he tells of this experience. They hung me up with a hook and put a gas mask on me. They clenched a hole at the end of the tube, blocking the air stream so I couldn't breathe. When I was unconscious, they opened the hole and covered it with a cloth soaked in ethanol. I took a deep breath because I was on the brink of loss of consciousness, and I felt a fire in my chest. I couched and gasped from the lack of fresh air, and then they began to beat me again with batons on my chest and backs, which was repeated over and over again. I don't know how historians in the future will call this historical period, 
the world order based on UN Charter and international law is collapsing before our eyes. The international peace and security system established after the Second World War provided unjustified indulgences for certain countries. It didn't cope well with global challenges before, but now it is stalling and reproducing ritualistic movements. The work of the Security Council is paralyzed. We have entered the period of turbulence, and now fires will occur more and more often in different parts of the globe because the international wiring is faulty and sparks are everywhere. I live in Kiev, and my native city, like thousands of other Ukrainian cities, are constantly being shelled not just by Russian rockets, but also Iranian drones. China is helping Russia circumvent sanctions and import technologies critical to our fear. North Korea sent Russia more than a million artillery shells. Syria votes at the UN General Assembly in support of Russia. We are dealing with the formation of the entire authoritarian bloc. All these regimes featured a crucial commonality. They have the same idea of what a human being is. Authoritarian leaders consider people as object of control and deny them rights and freedom. Democracies consider people, their rights and freedom to be the highest value. There is no way to negotiate it. The existence of the free world always threatens dictatorship with the loss of power because human beings inherently have desire for freedom. That is why, if we don't be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. If authoritarian regimes support each other, democracies definitely should demonstrate unity in defending their values. When the full-scale invasion began, democratic countries said, let's help Ukraine not to fail. However, this is a time to change this narrative and help Ukraine to win. Because there is a significant difference between let's help Ukraine not to fail and let's help Ukraine to win. These differences is measures in types of weapons, speed of decisions, and severity of sanctions. And the problem is that we don't have time. We are dying. The time for us converts in numerous deaths in battlefield, in numerous deaths in occupied territories, in numerous deaths in deep rear. This is not a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Russia wants to convince the entire world that democracy freedom, rule of law, and human rights are fake values because they couldn't protect anyone during the war. Russia wants to convince that a state with a strong military potential and nuclear weapon can break international order, can dictate its rules to entire international community, and even forcibly change internationally recognized borders. And if Putin succeeds, it will encourage other authoritarian leaders in different parts of the world to do the same. The international system of peace and security is not working. This means that democratic governments will be forced to invest their money not in education, healthcare, culture or business development, not in solving global problems like climate change or social inequality, but in weapons. We will be witness an increase of a number of nuclear states, the emergence of robotic armies, 
and new weapons of mass destruction, if Russia succeeds and this scenario comes true, we can find ourselves in a world which will be dangerous for everyone without any exception. The world needs democratic success of Ukraine, but we approach the second anniversary of the full-scale war in a critical situation. Russia spends 40% of its budget on military expenses, and this is only the official numbers, which is lower than the real one. At the same time, the supplementary package for Ukraine in the United States Congress is blocked. We are expecting a new massive Russian attack in the coming months. That is why Putin, in his interview to Tucker Carlson, repeated his genocidal claims that Ukrainians do not exist. He is confident that Ukrainians have to be either re-educated as Russians or killed. And that is why we have no other choice. If we stop our resistance, they will be no us anymore. While we are asking our partners for air defense system, Russia is destroying Ukraine's energy system. Today, there was an attack on the country's largest thermal power plants. Ukrainians will face a very difficult winter. Europe, the United States, and the other countries will face a new flow of refugees. But I'm here to say that despite everything, the story of Ukraine is life-affirming. In dramatic times, hope rises. When freedom is blocked, it starts to powerfully break out. I know from my own experience that even when you can't rely on the legal mechanisms, when you can't rely on the international system of peace and security, you can still rely on people. We are accustomed to look at political matters through the lens of the states and interstate organizations, but ordinary people have a much greater impact that they can even imagine. Mass mobilization of ordinary people in different countries of the world can make the history. Yes, the future is unclear, but the truth is that future is not pre-written. Nevertheless, it's such a privilege to have this chance to fight for future, which we want for us and for our own children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for this touching, inspiring, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Now it's time for reflections. Uh, just like in the liturgy, after reading the scripture, we have to reflect a bit on it. So it's time for reflection. And I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage to, do this to begin this reflection, please. Whatever, wherever. Well, maybe we'll start in the order you are sitting. So, do you want to begin with your own? Oh, oh yes. Okay. Yes, good, please. And before I'd be a slave 
I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Yes, before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and I'll fight for my right to be free. I didn't get much further than reading the first line of your speech because immediately when I read that you are a civil rights lawyer, I began to think of the lawyers who worked for the freedom of my ancestors who were enslaved, particularly those who would stand on the docks of the city of Philadelphia, waiting for someone to bring their so-called slave into Pennsylvania, into Philadelphia. Because it took some time, but eventually the laws changed so that if they stepped foot in Pennsylvania, their enslaved person would be free. But the enslaved person had to know that they were free. And so the lawyers would wait there by the docks and come up to people and say, do you want your freedom? Do you want your freedom? Sometimes the so-called masters would say, if anyone asked you, you're supposed to say, oh, I'm free, I'm just traveling. But there are amazing stories Amazing stories of people such as Jane Johnson, who said to the waiter who was serving food to the family, repeatedly she said, I do want my freedom. I do want my freedom. And eventually, that waiter, so this was even before the lawyer came, <laughs> the waiter serving the food got a hold of her and got two other people to usher her out of the restaurant, her and her two children, and got her to the vigilance committee who helped some 800 people get their freedom in that manner. So when I think of you as a civil rights lawyer, making sure that the world knows what is happening and working through the court systems that we know fail at various times, I'm reminded of so many courageous people. And as I've continued to think, I've, I've been reflecting because my, my grad students uh, in theological studies, we've been studying liberating theologies. And the latest book that we read is called Mirror to the Church. And it is a book by Father Emmanuel Contagole, and I'm not sure that I'm saying his name correctly. One of his parents was Hutu. One of his parents was Tutsi. They were lucky enough to live in Uganda. So when the genocide began in Rwanda, they were not there. But the book that he writes is about the fact that the Christian churches failed in Rwanda. And if you're one of the people that likes to keep up with dates, 
You know that it was 30 years ago this past Sunday that the genocide in Rwanda began. It was a week after Easter, and the same people who had been celebrating Holy Week and singing with the choir in each other, with each other, began slaughtering each other. And the question that he asked again and again is, were the waters of tribalism deeper and stronger than the waters of baptism? So we have to keep telling the stories as hard as it is to see and to hear. And I thank you for having the courage to keep telling the stories, especially because for those of us who are uh, Catholic Christians, this past Sunday, we were reading the story about Thomas. You know, Doubting Thomas. And part of that story says, blessed are those who do not see, but believe. But in our time, we see, we hear, and we know almost in an instant about people like George Floyd about people like Breonna Taylor. So we can't say blessed are those who don't see and yet believe, because through your work, you are helping us to always see and to always know. And so we have to say, blessed are we who see, and who believe, and who act, and who do what must be done. Am I on? Ah, oh, I'm on here. Um, well, I thought I originally wanted to start with a few comments on law because that's where that's where you began your presentation. But I think maybe I'll do a tie in with religion because I think the religious dynamic in Russia and Ukraine is actually you know, like a problematic or um, or difficult at the moment because one of the things is that Russia is since 1989 very, very, very religious. It's deeply religious, and it makes me think of Nikita Mikhailkov, who's the great film director, active from the 60s to today, and he said the war against Ukraine, he's Russian, is a calling from God. And so that you know you have that rhetoric in Russia. You can look at some of the more popular poppy patriotic videos. They use religious symbolism like like it's just like you've never seen before. It's very strange. And then the other one, of course, is the close ties of the patriarch in Moscow with the Kremlin. I mean, they're very, very close together. And so you can see images of all the soldiers who are heading to the front being blessed. And so Russia is, it's a very dangerous, it's a very, very dangerous combination of church and state. And then the other thing, which I think is worth mentioning in this context, is that the Russian church it, received, it became autocephalous, uh, it, like it, it became independent from the patriarchy and then in Constantinople in the 14th century. And in 2019, did I get the, 2019, the Ukrainian church became autocephalous and broke off from the Russian church. So even though Russia is very religious, there is an ongoing battle in Ukraine between the two churches. And there are a lot of believers in Ukraine who are still Russian Orthodox and have not broken officially as the Ukrainian church did. So that, that religious dynamic is, is still around. And I think that's, that's important to mention. The other thing I just wanted to bring up, I won't talk too long, was um, the difficulty of law and the legal order. And, and somehow, like what type of international legal institution can ensure that we, we have a resolution to what happened, the calls for reparations and whatever. And these are very, very difficult. So I just want to give a minor little bit of background about, about international law. It's very minor. But 
in, in, in the Hague Peace Conference in 1899, Nicholas II, the Russian Tsar, he was the one who was instrumental in establishing the International Court of Justice. And the International Court of Justice is essentially still exists in, in the United Nations. And back then, however, it was not concerned so much with human rights as in with the proper conduct of war. So it had a very narrow, very narrow definition. In the end of the 1990s, the International Criminal Court comes into being. And the International Criminal Court is, in today's world, almost more in the news, if you will. But what's interesting about the International Criminal Court, which is designed to go after individuals rather than countries or something like that, is its membership. And if you look at the membership, Russia is not a member. India is not a member. China is not a member. The United States, is, United States is not a member, and Israel is not a member. And so that creates a difficult dynamic because it's the ICC that put out an arrest warrant for Putin, but the Russians do not recognize that church. And so in terms of problematic legal international orders, there you already have a, you already have a problem in that case. Another example you can think of in the early 2000s in terms of bringing people to justice is Slobodan Milosevic, who is the leader in Serbia. In his case, they set up a special tribunal, the, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia within the United Nations. And so that was a very specific. Russia actually signed on to that one. Whereas in this case, it's hard to imagine that the United Nations could, could come forward with an International Criminal tribunal, tribunal for the former, well, for Russia, and that Russia would somehow agree to this. And Russia is on the Security Council. So that is... That's a very difficult case. And again, the outcome with the Milosevic case, he died before they had a conclusion. And so these are all, these, in terms of le international legal order, these are always very, very complicated. Another complication, which one gets here, is the broadening of terms. So if you think of terms like genocide and human rights, human rights has undergone a, a, a rapid and broadening transition. I mean, if you think, French Revolution in the 18th century and moving forward to, to become an even more broader, broader, and broader. And as it extends it, as the, the, the human rights word sort of um, takes on more and more actions, it becomes more difficult for the court to adjudicate. So that's, that's a very important one. And also genocide. I mean, you can read all over the Russian newspapers that Ukraine is committing cultural genocide. That's a very classic Kremlin expression and so it's, it's just like everybody's using it to the point that it's original a lot of its original force has been has been weakened so that is a bit of a bit of a problem um the other one i just want to talk about quickly is the response in russia because one of the issues in march of 2023 the international criminal court in the hague it put out an arrest warrant not only for Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, but also for Lvova Belova, the woman who runs the, it's, it's something like the, um, the special council for children's issues in Russia, translate something like that. And they put out an arrest warrant for both those individuals. Now, the crime was, I can actually read you, read you the crime, allegedly responsible for the war crime of unlawful deportation of population, children, and that of unlawful transfer, for, transfer of population children from occupied areas of Ukraine to the Russian Federation. Now, to one little historical note is that, in fact, if you look, I, I've written about natural disasters. After natural disasters, children would always be evacuated in the Soviet Union, whether it was Ukraine or Russia. So that the, the procedure of evacuation actually has deep historical, deep historical roots in, in Russia. But I think what a more interesting point here is if you think of the idea of a war crime and you think of the Nazis and we, you know what did the Nazis do when they realized they were losing and they, they were being pushed east by the Soviet armies well when they evacuated Auschwitz and moved moved west as they, they went back to Germany they basically did everything possible to eliminate the evidence the Nazis knew they had done something wrong but what about the war crime the ICC war crime of the deportation and unlawful transfer of population of children well, it's all over the newspapers in Russia. Like you can go to you can go to Tatarstan, you can go to Vladivostok. They'll have stories on all these kids. What are these kids doing? Well, all the stories will tell you. The kids are learning school. They're doing exercise. Generally speaking, they tend to be taken to um, what would be the uh, like 
Boy Scout or Girl Scout camps? Would that be the, the equivalent expression in the US? So it's meant to be a very interesting and fun and educative experience. So, but it's just interesting when you think of the evidence required for a war crime, and there's all this, all this news going on in Russia, which completely sort of is open about it. And so their attitude at a court, because remember, a court requires a defense. Their attitude at a court, and I don't think they would show up, is, a very, is very, very different when it's all over the news in Russia and it's presented as a positive. They're, they're hiding nothing. So just, it's a different dynamic to a, to a war crime. The other, other thing that I want to say is just a is very few little short things is beyond this, and, and you're listening to what's going on in Ukraine because I study Russia, and and part of me actually focuses on Russia, not Ukraine. I I watch the like Ukrainian Russian language news and stuff like that, but I always think in the back of my mind, my training is to think about Russia, and Russia has serious problems, and one of the most serious problems is as we talked about civil society is the uh, initial reduction of civil society, and then the elimination of civil society. So like Memorial, which uh, Cyril mentioned earlier, that has been shut down. I mean, I was in Moscow a few years ago, went to one of their meetings, they're gone. Another one, though, which I think is more interesting, and I'll end on that, is the Sakharov Center. Sakharov, the great physicist, a titan of Soviet weaponry. Very important individual. He did become a descender, but his center which had a, a little museum on the gulag, was shut down because they're a foreign agent. And so like, they're going after their own heroes. And I think that's an important one. Navalny was never a Soviet hero. Sakharov was. And so that atmosphere in Russia has changed. And so Russia, Russia itself is a difficult, very, very difficult road ahead. So I'll stop on that. Thank you. No expert on Russia, but <laughs> I will take um, I'll, I'll try to uh, work into um, what Nigel just uh, talked about. Um, this, the, the differences in narratives is, is very stark. You were just mentioning how children um, who are being taken into Russia are in one aspect is being said, well, they're getting educated, Boy Scout, Girl Scout. Um, in another sense, they are being trafficked Right, and so um, I think this is where I would like to chime in. Um, I'm a professor of women's and gender studies, and so um, I'm trained as a feminist literary critic. And so stories are what I know and what I study. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of storytelling and the way that narratives are being spun, um, both here in, um, the United States about uh, what's going on in Ukraine and also in Russia. And so throughout my career, I've researched how literature represents and narrates stories about human trafficking and violence against women. Um, the feminist philosopher Trim Minha writes that the story depends upon every one of us coming into being. It needs us all, needs us remembering, understanding, creating what we have heard together to keep on coming into being, the story of a people, of us. Yet all too often, our stories are stifled by shame, fear, or apathy. When evil goes unpunished, as Alexandra has noted in her talk, impunity abounds and contributes to a climate of fear that perpetuates human rights violations and breeds fearful silence or worse, just plain apathy. Gendered violence is also something I want to touch upon um, because it was uh, part of Alexandra's talk. Um, gender violence is a prominent feature of colonial power relations and military aggression. Sexual violence is often a hidden crime because it's associated with shame and remains largely unreported and silenced. And while crime, while it's a crime under international law, rape used as a weapon of war continues this ugly reign of terror. There was systematic gender violence during World War II when brothels were established in concentration camps to cater to Nazi soldiers. Young girls and women from the Asia Pacific were forced and conscripted to work as sex slaves in comfort stations for the Japanese military. 
More recently, we've witnessed ethnic cleansing through mass rape of women during the Bosnian conflict, the Rwandan genocide, and the genocidal campaigns by ISIS against the Yadizis. Genocidal rape and the eradication of a culture, a language, civilization, and people should not be allowed to happen. The conflict in Ukraine has also aggravated gendered violence against civilians and created a pernicious vacuum that has heightened the dangers of human trafficking in that region. This conversation, this gathering that we're having is a, trying to grow awareness around this very complicated notion. As Alexandra and her Center for Civil Liberties have done, we need to document, remember, and preserve the stories, especially from the vantage point of those most vulnerable, who are relegated to the haunting shadows left by the atrocities of war. Stories of survivors of trauma, survivors of atrocities that Alexandra has uh, powerfully demonstrated to us, they need to be transmitted, translated, represented, and received. Such stories contribute to the ongoing opinions and emotions of a global public that can garner support for establishing special international tribunals at the, interna at the United Nations. Um, Nigel mentioned um, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. There was also an ad hoc um, Comfort Women International Military Tribunal of the Far East and the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Our conversation here today demonstrates the importance of not just looking at the data, of course, that's important to understand the scope of how many individuals have died, have suffered, have been lost, have been trafficked. But it also demands looking into the individual histories, stories, testimonies, and demanding accountability. Um, I study the uh, military sexual slavery during the um, World War II under uh, Japan. Um, and it took 50 years for the stories of those atrocities to bear light, to gain public attention, um, and you know, garner the interest of the international public. And that should just not be the case. And we see something very similar happening now. And I just wanna end with, um, since I also direct the Peace and Justice uh, program here at LMU, that justice and accountability are essential for reconciliation and working towards sustainable peace. To quote the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., without justice, there can be no peace. To talk about peace without investigating human rights violations and holding parties accountable is but an empty gesture without any substance. A crucial step in the search for peace is working towards justice. I'm very grateful for your thoughts and um, I can agree with everything which you have just said. Probably I just provide several details. And first, I will start with this very sensitive problem, which you mentioned, the forcible deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia. Sometimes we can't understand very important detail. These children are not just educated there. They re-educated as Russians. And these crimes is a part of genocidal policy which Russia imposed against Ukraine. Because using the legal terms, they put children from one national group, brought them forcibly to another national group in order to bring them up as Russians and to destroy Ukrainian nation. And the cynicism of the situation that when we speak about forcibly deported Ukrainian children, 
we also speak about children who have parents, who have parents arrested by Russians, who have parents killed by Russians but still have their family member in Ukraine, which trying to return them home and failed. I will tell you one story. This is a story of family from Mariupol. And the father uh, is bringing up three children by himself. And when Russians occupied the city, they were forcibly deported to Russia, but the father failed to pass filtration camp. And I will not stop on details what treatment he faced in this filtration camp, but miraculously he was released after some period of time. And the elder son find a way how to get him known that Father, if you will not come and take us, we will be in five days separated and adopted. And I don't know how, probably with a strength of love, his father find a way how quickly went to Russia, Russia is a huge country, to find their, his children and to bring them home. Unfortunately, the story is exception. Ukrainian authorities identified more than 19 thousands of Ukrainian children who were forcibly deported. Only 400 were returned home. These reflections uh, from the stage, from the panel, now it's time for, uh, for the rest of, um, of our audience to ask your questions. Uh, we have plenty of time, so I, th I think, I, I hope everyone who will want to speak will be able to speak. Uh, we have uh, some helpers with the mics, so just raise your hand and, um, uh, and ask your questions. And first, first, please name yourself, introduce yourself briefly. Um, my name is Camila. I'm from USC. Um, I, was, I had a question to Alexandra. Uh, what's your vision on achieving justice for Ukrainian people after the Ukrainian victory? And what do you see the role of international community and even Russia that will uh, play in achieving the justice for the Ukrainian people? Thank you for this question. I work with people affected by this war directly. And I know that all these people need to restore not just their broken lives, their broken families, their broken visions of the future, but also their broken belief that justice is possible, even though delaying in time. And I also know that people see justice very differently. For some people, justice means to see their perpetrators behind the bars. For another people, justice means to get compensations, and without this, they will feel unsatisfied. For some people, justice means just a possibility to know truth, what happened with their beloved ones. For another people, justice means just a possibility to be heard and to get official recognition that something which happened with them is not just immoral, but illegal. And justice for me means that we have to develop a comprehensive strategy to reach all these needs of people. And according to this strategy, appropriate legal infrastructure. And the role of international community is very crucial, but let me say very honestly, as a human being, I want not just to record and to investigate and to bring perpetrators, for, make them accountable for everything which have already been done. I want to stop this. We are in war. 
we have no idea. Either we are in the end of the war, in the middle of the war, or just in the beginning of the war. And Russians killed unarmed, alarm, unarmed. And now the international support to Ukraine is frozen. And as I mentioned during my speech, we're expecting a new Russian attack. It means that we, as a human rights lawyer, expecting a numerous crimes and hundreds of thousands of other victims of these crimes. So my first request to international community is please help us to stop Russians. If we will not be able to stop it in Ukraine, they will go further. And as a lawyer, I know that there are a lot of discussion whether or not we have comprehensive evidence to prove in the International Criminal Court that this war has genocidical intent. And lawyers like such discussions. But I think that we have to think, first of all, like humans. I mean, I'm afraid that while we are discussing this issue, we are losing a very crucial point that if we will do nothing we can reach a situation when even the severe skeptics will have no doubt that this is a genocide, but it will be too late for us. I, I actually have one that perhaps we all you know, can think about. Uh, when you were speaking about how religious a society Russia is. And thinking about Rwanda, where 95% of Rwandans are Christian, so, you know, the most Christian country in Africa. And, and, you know, thinking about the religion also in Ukraine, what hope do we have in our religious communities to help stop that, to help change the story? What, what hope do you see? I see the hope in people in my country. Because um, when large-scale war started, not just Putin, but also our international partners were confident that we have no potential to resist. Because Russia is so enormous opposing power. Russia was 11th economy in the world. Russia has a uh, much greater military potential, nuclear weapon, and much bigger population. And I was in Kiev that time. I refused to evacuate while Russian troops tried to circle my native city. And I remember how international organizations, even international humanitarian organizations, evacuated their personnel. But ordinary people remained. And ordinary people started to do extraordinary things. It were ordinary people who helped to survive under artillery fire. It were ordinary people who took people out from the ruined cities. It were ordinary people who rescued people, trapped to the rubbles into the residential buildings. It were ordinary people who broke through the encirclement to provide humanitarian aid. And suddenly, it became obvious that ordinary people fighting for their freedom and human dignity is stronger than even the second army in the world. And this is my hope. Uh, I haven't heard it mentioned anywhere, but uh, I liken uh, Russia, especially in relation to their uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, to the Boko Haram, uh, which uh, translates as forbidden uh, Western education. And um, so there is, there is a certain sort of mentality that justifies things, a, a certain sort of, you know, with the Ruski Emir and the... Uh, uh, it goes back uh, centuries, uh, uh, and you can see that in the Halamador. 
you see the impunity that has become a, uh, an art form in Russia. And so uh, how do you combat a certain sort of deceptiveness that, uh, you know, Russia is known for counterfeits of all sorts of things, even vacations and malware and uh, ransomware. And there, when you look at what's going on and you, you, you're speaking with a certain language that most of the world understands, but then Russia has a whole different way of interpreting that. When, you, when, you, when the rest of the world values authenticity, but there is a certain sort of value for, for manipulation and deception, how do you how do you translate that? How do you breed a certain sort of um, accountability that overcomes the impunity? Probably, I will start to answer this important question, which for sure needs a very long answer. I will try to be brief. With, a, with one thesis, Russia is empire, and empire has a center, but has no borders. It means when empire has energy, empire always try to expand. When empire has no energy, empire, empire is waiting for time to have it. And when we speak about this tradition of punity, this uh, is a long-lasting tradition, which uh, also has a core basis when we speak about Russia as empire. Because Putin governed his country not just with repressions and censorship, but also with a special social contract, which is between Kremlin's elite and majority of Russian people. And the problem is that this contract is based in so-called Russian glory. And the problem is that majority of Russians still see their glory in the forcible restoration of Russian empire. And that is why it's so important to get success. Um, let me quote my Russian human rights colleagues from Memorial, which was just mentioned. I also use this opportunity to raise awareness that my friend and colleague, the head of Human Rights Center Memorial, 71-year-old Oleg Harlov, just four weeks ago was imprisoned. And while Russia closed the human rights organizations, and because they destroyed the last monuments for humanity in the country. This is what Russia is doing. It's also the war on symbolical level. And when I refer to my brave Russian colleagues who are minority, who are in a very <coughs> vulnerable position because they face not just with repressions from the Putin's regime, but also against the <coughs> majority of public opinion in the country. And it's very difficult to be against the majority of public opinion. And I ask them, how we can help you? Human rights organization in Russia are closed. You are labeled as foreign agents. Part of my colleagues uh, were forced to leave Russia. Part of them in jail. Part of them are preparing to be in jail. They always answered, if you want to help us, please be successful. Because only success of Ukraine and military defeat of Russia will provide a chance for democratic future of Russia itself. No guarantee. There is no guarantee in our life at all. But a chance. And this is a huge luxury to have such chance. Thank you, Nigel, please. I just want to say something quickly because you're, you're talking about Russia, but I think a, a, an additional problem that we have, and I'm speaking as a historian of Russia, is that probably until the year 2000, no American would really realize that Ukraine is its own country. And if you look at the way that Russian history was taught in the, in the United States in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, 
in the 1990s, it's Russia. And it would be treated as Russia. And it's only things like I'm a member of the Canadian Association of Slavists, which has all sorts of Ukrainian members, and they still complain about this. They still complain that in the United States, it's taught as the history of Russia. So, so the idea that it's an, um, an empire, Ukraine, they would just think of, no, that belongs to Russia. Even Westerners would think that. And that's part of the problem. And so that's why like, these, these academic groups have made a huge effort to actually promote the history of Ukraine as an independent history, which even here in the United States and Canada was not, was not taken for granted in the past. Thank you. A very important remark indeed, yes. Um, other questions, please? Yes. Another one in the back. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, I am Georgi and I also come from USC. Um, I have a question about the referendums that were held in Crimea and uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Obviously, this was the first step before Russia's recognition of those territories. And obviously, we know that there were no uh, foreign observers to at least issue reports on those referendums. Um, and I have very limited knowledge on this issue, but I'm interested from your perspective as a human rights lawyer, what were the biggest uh, human rights violations when those referendums were held? Especially we know that in Crimea, for example, there are many people who did not evacuate when um, Russian forces were approaching. Thank you for this question. I think the biggest uh, human rights violation during this so-called referendum is that people have no right to vote. <laughs> it's, it's, we have to name the things what they are. We can't call this procedure as a referendum. We were there during this uh, procedure. Our mobile groups were there. And uh, the Russians organized a so-called referendum in several days just to legitimize uh, their invasion in the eyes of Russian population. Because don't forget, this war has not just military dimension, but also informational dimension, economical dimension, value dimension. And um, Putin's regime, they, they uh, still uh, work on all these dimensions, not just in Russia, but also here in the United States. Uh, Russia, um, launching the war for your hearts and minds. And Russia spent billions and billions of dollars to achieve uh, their goals. And um, I un understood that probably people uh, who are not very familiar with this so-called uh, um, uh, referendum, which is completely fake because they were organized under the um, arms, <laughs> uh, but it's much more visible to explain what's going on just to take a recent example of so-called president elections in Russia, where no opposition candidates was even registered, where all uh, independent media was closed, uh, where the biggest uh, political opponent of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, who was in prison, I mean Alexei Navalny, was killed. So I think that the world lack honestly. We have to be very careful when we name things what they are. We can't um, name this election, I mean this procedure which was held in Russia. We can't name this referendum I mean, this uh, procedure which was organized by Russia in occupied Ukrainian territories. Because even using these terms, we help Russia to legitimize, legitimize these false procedures. Hi. Um, my name is Kinthia Fergus, and um, I've written in the past about uh, lawlessness and injustice um, through a biblical perspective. And one of the things that we, um, that the Bible talks about 
is um, something called the powers, the principalities, and the rulers. And they operate um, in hiding, sort of like organized criminals. And you use this term, um, solidaritarianism, which really resonated, um, which seems to operate through war on its face, but then in the background, there are these powers that are trafficking children or doing all these other things behind the scene, scene. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the parallels between um, what you've been calling solidarityism, which really resonates, and what we see sort of going on all over the world globally of these powers that are operating like in hiding, like organized criminals. Thank you for this question. Um, probably I will start with the point that human rights defenders have a very similar mindset. They know that if we are fighting for justice, we have to fight for justice globally. Because you can't build paradise even if you island when the part, another part of the world is bleeding. Uh, the problem is that so many fires now uh, happening in parallel. And um, as a human beings, our efforts are modest and we can't cover all the problems. And that is why we have to think strategically. Let me use an example, not by Ukrainian human rights defenders, but by Syrian human rights defenders. You know that the horrible war in Syria is going on for years and years. And Unfortunately, um, events in Syria are not uh, anymore in the front page, neither in the United States nor in Ukraine. But people are being killed, tortured, and raped there every day. And this is a horror which became a daily life of people in Syria. And when large-scale invasion started, I got the letter from Syrian human rights defenders and they wrote to me, we are with you in solidarity. We know what war is about. We know what human pain is about. Please tell us, what do you need to succeed in your fight for justice? Because your success will be our success. And I think that it's very right approach because when we will start to compete with each other for attention to problem, we all will fail. We have to unite efforts, we have to support each other, and we have to do something with this wrong international wiring. I mean, we have to st push for cardinal reform of UN system of peace and security is not work anymore. It can't protect people against authoritarianism and against the wars. And this is not just problem of nations who are in wars or who suffered under authoritarian rulers. It's our common problem. This year, half of population um, in the world will go to election. But don't be naive. Don't live in illusion. Because 80% of population in the world live in non-free or partially free societies which means that people who have a real right to vote, who can a real right to say what they think, who can have a real right to love whatever their hearts tell them to love, or to freely choose whom God they want to pray, they are minority. It's just 20%. And we are losing freedom in the world. Because the problem is not in fact that in authoritarian countries, the space for freedom is shrinking to the size of the prison cell. The problem is that even in well-developed democracies, the, the political forces who start to put into the question the universal declaration of human rights and human dignity as such are gain weight. And there is a reason for this. Because 
current generations in these well-developed democracies, they inherited their democracy from their parents. They have never fought for this. They began a consumers of democracy. They don't understand the meaning of these values. They start to see a freedom uh, like a possibility to make a choice between different types of cheeses in supermarket. And that is why the current generations in these well-developed democracies began more and more easily exchange their freedom for economic benefits, for illusion of security, for populist claims, and for their own comfort. But the truth is that freedom is very fragile. We can't attain human rights once and forever. We make our choice every day. And only determination to act and, and, and to defend our values def de defines societies which have a future. Thank you. On this point of uh, speaking about choices and democracy and elections, I'd like to mention, I, I've just received a message from Michael Huffington, the founder of the Institute and the patron of this, uh, of this series of lectures. And he's speaking, uh, he asked me to, sp to present him as a former US congressman, as you know, he was in the US Congress um, <clears throat> from the state of California. And he says, the US Congress should see uh, Alexandra's presentation. Hopefully they will pass the foreign aid package this month as it is crucial that Ukraine receives it. So here, here, let it be so. Thank you, Michael, for your comment. Father Tom. Uh, Tom Rausch from LMU. Uh, Alexandra, you, you just said a moment ago, freedom is losing. And when I saw the title for your talk, Unpunished Evil Grows, I thought, what a wonderful idea. Uh, but how is that going to get done? So uh, I don't think there's really an answer, uh, but I, I want to express my own frustration. What I see going on today is, is the growth of these autocrats, I call them the strong men in so many countries that have no use for freedom, no use for democracy. They impose their will, whatever the cost. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping, Putin, Trump, uh, um, Orban, Daniel Ortega. Uh, this, the number is growing, and that's just a few of them. How do we work together to punish evil? That, that's the, you know, your topic. Uh, when I look at what's going on, it's, uh, these autocrats you know, have all of this power. The UN is powerless. It had one brief moment of success with Milosevic, uh, I think, after the, the terrible problems in the Balkans. But how do we unite? And the second point that's really a part of that is Nations, including our own, don't want to work together towards any kind of international court because they're also compromised. <laughs> so, so where do we go? Where, where do we go? It's, it's more than, than good people doing their best. We, we need solidarity. We need you know, working together on the governmental issues across the world, but it's not happening. Thank you for this question. I think first we have to understand that ordinary people have a much greater impact that they can even imagine. And we can change the history for better. Um, let me use our Ukrainian example. 10 years ago, we have Revolution of Dignity. It was time when millions and millions of people stood up their voice against corrupt and authoritarian governments, government in Ukraine. and. We faced with uh, enormous prosecutions. I was a coordinator of civil initiative Yevromaidan SOS. We brought up several thousands of people to provide legal and other assistance to prosecuted protesters. And every day, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of people who were beaten, tortured, arrested, accused, and fabricated criminal or administrative charges passed through our care. We faced against a whole state machine. And people start to feel this learned helplessness. What they can do, they are not gods, they are human beings. And in this moment, Ukrainian artists ma made a series of posters. 
And one of them I remember very clearly. It was a poster with drop. And it was titled, We are drop in the ocean. Which means two meaning. First, yes, we are human beings. We are not God. But together, we are ocean. Together, we can change this situation. And second, yes, we are all human beings, which means in comparison with challenges, probably all our efforts may seem like modest. And this is a true that we can't change this war just with our individual efforts, but without our individual efforts, nothing will be changed. And second, which we have to do, we have to act. Not just to believe, but to act. It's very important. Like uh, during uh, this time of revolution of dignity, when we faced again the whole state machine, it worked like that, that paramilitary group Titushki cooperated with prosecutors. Prosecutors cooperated with courts. The former president, security services, former government, the majority of parliament were against us. They were against people. They want to liquidate the peaceful protest, even physically. And in this situation, it was so easy to say, but what we can do, we are human beings. The law doesn't work. But because our lawyers, because our volunteers fought very honestly for each person, for each procedure's measures, like the war, pre pretend that the, war ex that the law exists, we start to work not just on legal, but on symbolical level, on level where ideas and senses are emerged. And the main idea which we created with our work was that there is no guarantee in our life. You can be beaten, you can be arrested, you can even be killed, but there are people who will fight for you, who will never left you alone, who will do their best to help you, to release you, and to care about your family. And this understanding provides millions of people in Ukraine the courage to continue the fight and to overcome the fear. So believe and act. Hello. Um, my name is Connor. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for this whole presentation and for the honesty and the bravery of it. But I also wanted to ask a question that maybe moving away from some of the structural, institutional, legal questions we've been asking, getting into the psychological and spiritual impacts of empire and of occupation. Because I'm thinking about this I think for many reasons, um, you know, in part as someone who had a friend who wasn't able to be here today, who lived in Dublin for many years and still talk and talks about how people still speak in hushed tones about so many topics because of the history of the British, the British imperialism, the British occupation that's, I would say, is still ongoing in the North. I think about it as an Arab American of Lebanese descent who would love to see that homeland one day and will not be able to in my lifetime for so many reasons, because of the legacy of the many empires, because of Hezbollah, because of the more recent Israeli occupations. I think about it as somebody whose grandmother grew up in the Philippines during the Japanese occupation and who, whether consciously or unconsciously, was feeling the echoes and the ghosts of that occupation for so much of their life is how do we, on that interpersonal level, on that individual level, on that spiritual level, reckon with the ways that these things don't leave us and the ways that these things stick with us and the both material and intangible effects that these will continue to have even 
when, you know, when the war is won. You know, like if Ukraine is freed from occupation, then the ghosts of that occupation are still going to be with Ukrainians. Thank you for your question. I, I feel your pain. Um, my nation was under occupation for centuries. We restore our independence only in 19s. Um, and then uh, we got a chance uh, to study Ukrainian history in the school. And I was a child when I started to study Ukrainian history. And suddenly I understood that I'm not from Russian-speaking family. I'm from forcibly Russified Russian-speaking family. Because the native language of my, per my father was Ukrainian. But because my father wanted to become a doctor, he entered the medical university in Kiev. And the entire education in Ukraine, as a part of Soviet uh, uh, empire, was um, only in, in Russian. And even more, if you still continue to speak Ukrainian, you will be treated uh, as a secondary person. My father, he is not a fighter. <laughs> He don't want to, to be secondary, he wants to be normal, so he switched to, to Russian in order to survive. And when I understood it, being in school, I decided to speak Ukrainian, to return to my roots, to improve this injustice. And this is a long lasting process because you can ask, um, and I was presented here as a first uh, representative of individuals or organization in Ukraine which got Nobel Peace Prize and any other Nobel Prize. But this is only because we was a part of Russian Empire for centuries. There are a lot of Nobel laureates who has Ukrainian origins. But either they are not identify themselves as Ukrainians because being under occupation in order to survive, you people switch their identity. Or they have no chance to get this Nobel, like Vasily Stus, who was killed when he was nominated to Nobel Peace Prize in Soviet Hulak. So this is a tragedy um, which is going on not just in Ukraine, unfortunately. And I strongly support this world, uh, this words uh, that um, there is a responsibility for uh, Western communities uh, for this uh, fact as well. Because for too long, uh, people in the West look to our part of the world through the Russian prism. I can ha tell you one <laughs> funny story, uh, because it's connected with the United States. You have, bri you have brilliant and uh, um, very famous museum, Metropolitan. And this museum has a picture of Degas, uh, which is called Russian Dancer. And when you look to this picture, and if you are Russians, you understand that these girls are not Russian dancers, <laughs> because they wear traditional Ukrainian clothes, like this traditional flower crown on your heads. So even being Russian, you understand that it's not Russian dancers at all. And Ukrainian museum uh, representatives uh, send numerous letters to Metropolitan Museum that you have to do something with this. Uh, make them know that uh, this is a wrong title, explain this complicity, do something, not just let this. And, and they were ignored. Only when large-scale invasion started, Metropolitan Museum changed the title of this picture. And now uh, this picture is called Dancers in the Ukrainian Clothes. <laughs> Probably they still think it's Russian dancers, <laughs> but just wearing Ukrainian clothes. Okay, it's a joke, but it's a huge uh, first step. So what I ask you, 
people in the West have to find intellectual bravery to understand that you look to our part of the world for so long, that you know so little about Ukraine, about Yakutia, about Tatarstan, about Ingushetia, about Belarus, about other countries in our region, that you have to study um, and to examine and to find the truth and to base your opinion on knowledge, but not Russian narratives, which were imposed for centuries. I think that was a great advertisement for my classes, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> Right, thank you. I think on this note, uh, we should conclude. And uh, I'd like to conclude this with a lot of thanks, first of all, to Alexandra for agreeing to come. For accepting the challenge in her very busy gra uh, 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 schedule. She came from um, New York City. She had meetings in Indiana, in, uh, in New York City. She will continue to San Francisco from here. Then DC meetings with uh, uh, activists, politicians, uh, congressmen, uh, congresswomen, and so forth. <clears throat> and she, find, she found the uh, time um, uh, for, for this talk. Thank you again. Uh, we also thank, I'd like to thank the, our panelists who also found time in, in your busy, busy schedule. Thank you for your very thoughtful reactions, uh, sharing with us your wisdom from your disciplines, from your life. Uh, I think it was a great discussion, a great experience, at least for me personally. Many thanks to every, well, many thanks to the members of the advisory board of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute who are present. Some of you are present here. Uh, right, yes. Uh, many thanks to Robin for coming, representing, and uh, representing herself, the college, the leadership, being uh, uh, so much, uh, well, a, a soul and the heart of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. She is very much involved in the, in the, works of, in the work of the Institute. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> many thanks to those who helped to uh, make this event happen. Uh, Marlene, primarily, uh, who did a lot of work. Uh, she is actually everything behind this, uh, this event. She did everything. Uh, Damian, who helped as well, who helps Marlene. Uh, Marlene. Uh, everyone, everyone literally who came, thank you for dedicating this time, for coming here. <clears throat> and now as a small token of appreciation, a small reward, <clears throat> there will be a treat for you <clears throat> just outside <clears throat> the Amazon Auditorium. Just, we could go. <clears throat> have your drinks, have your beverages, have your food, and have your conversation with Alexandra with other uh, members of our meeting today. So enjoy yourselves.